Hello and welcome to a special look back episode of Musical Talk. We've been running Musical Talk now for close to 11 years and one of the best things we've been able to do is to meet so many legendary people and get to interview them and hear their wonderful opinions on the show. We recently lost one of my close friends and one of the biggest, most talented orchestrators ever to be on Broadway, the legendary William David Brown. I was proud with the interview we did for him because, in my opinion, I felt it was the most in-depth and detailed interview and certainly the most lengthy one that you could find with Bill anywhere. So, prepare for a chat on old-school orchestrating in a very old-school style episode of Musical Talk where we will replay the interview that Jonathan Curran and I did with Bill back in March of 2008 as we were waiting for Gone With The Wind to open. What do you want me to be? Jonathan Cohen. Oh, right. <laughs> this is Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is episode 70 of Musical Talk. I'm sitting opposite Jonathan Cohen. Hello. Hello. And I'm also, si- I'm also sipping opposite. I'm sitting opposite who I called last week the greatest orchestrator in the world, Mr. William David Brown. Right. Hello. Hello. How are you? And you may call me Bill. Bill, how are you doing at the moment? Well, I'm very busy. We're uh, in the middle of furiously producing uh, Gone with the Wind. Directed by the great Trevor Nunn. And are you enjoying us? You are, I presume. Immensely. It's very engaging, very challenging, and very time-consuming. It's a, it's a lot of music, isn't it? Bill? Loads of music yeah. and a long book. Hugely long. Yeah. Mm. But, you know, he's. it is truly a book. He's not in any way trying to replicate the movie from the very beginning when he first took on the project, which is some years ago, actually. He made a point of that, that he was the wrong person if the producer was coming to him to, him to um, replicate Gone with the Wind of David O. Selznick. I, I wonder if we should maybe just mention something about the, maybe the style of the music a little bit. Or styles. Or styles, yes. Yes, well, they are American folk, mostly. They are by an American composer in the style. The composer, by the way, is Margaret Martin. She's from California. Dr. Margaret Martin. That's right. She is a a PhD in social sociology. The music is hymns from the Civil War period of of that genre. Folk songs. Shaker stuff? or um, No. There has been some investigation into something called shaped note singing. Oh. The celestial harp, were those singers called? Maybe shakers were also, I, I'm, I'm not completely certain of that, were involved in that kind of music. But uh, at that time in the South, in America, they would have done a lot of that kind of singing. Yeah. I suppose like the shakers, I, uh, though they were mostly Baptists, I think. Then there are marching songs, plantation songs. A Johnny Come Marching Home sort of uh, Yeah, stuff. except that was the northern song. Oh, wrong. <laughs> and they don't want that Jonathan. one. Jonathan! <laughs> it's a cool The Yankees were the bad guys in this. Yeah, yeah. Which and, is, I think, one of the reasons it became such an important book, because it challenged, at the time, what was that, 1938 or 39, around, it challenged the notion that the good guys were the... The North, obviously, the victors, and usually the victors are the good guys, aren't they? But that there is another side to that whole strife of the Civil War in America. And the Southern view was brought out very sympathetically and became, I guess I'm told, it's the largest selling book next to the Bible in the entire canon of literature let's just remind our listeners what bill has done in case you were born yesterday your music has been heard globally all over the world because you've done uh, miss saigon that, that little show a couple which of years began ago. here in london yes the secret garden which began here in london well not in no london, it didn't in yorkshire oh i see to be in the story yes showboat crazy for you carousel and wicked along with many others. You've done the West Side Story suite with the wonderful Joshua Bell. Right. It's a marvellous piece of music, which I'm sure we'll talk about. And a lot of stuff for, again, Trevor Nunn. You've done My Fair Lady reorchestrations. You've done Oklahoma. You've done... South Pacific. South Pacific. All Over at the National. Right? Yes. 
Okay, well, let's go back to how you started. What was your first project that you remember? Well, in orchestration, it was uh, a show called Sensations Off-Broadway, 1970, by Wally Harper. Oh, did, famous did you know? Wally Harper, yeah. Harper who um, Barbara, Barbara Cooks. Cooks a comp- more than a company. More than a company. Her mentor, orchestra, really, really yeah. Truly. And mentor. Yeah, yes. yeah. Wonderful. Oh, yeah. He and I were schoolmates in, um, at New England Conservatory, and I, then he moved to New York, and I moved to New York, and we kept in touch. So he called upon me to orchestrate his first show. It was quite lovely. It was a um, kind of a, at the time, contemporary-feeling take on the Romeo and Juliet story transcribed to New York. I've heard this. That's been done before, before, hasn't it? That's been done before. But another, ver- you know, another way of yeah. looking at it, but not, not the fighting. More, more of a family story about the two families. Um, and it uh, it lasted about a, under a year, I would say. Is there a recording of it? Do, 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 Never got one, yeah, unless there's a bootleg around somewhere. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. We had a string quartet on stage in a loft in the set, built in, visible, and a rock band in the pit. It was a gorgeous piece. Well, from there, um, I got a few more off-Broadway shows. One thing leads to another, and then finally got uh, a crack at a working on a Broadway show with Luther Henderson, who was one of the orchestrators of note at the time. And um, he gave me a, uh, a shot at a show called Rogers and Hart, which was lovely. Dick Rogers was still alive then. By the way, he, it is Richard Rogers officially, like I'm William David Brown, but when you work with him, he made a point of it. He said, it's Dick. Call me Dick. Or Lenny or... Yeah, and whenever you're, you know, you're with your colleagues, isn't that, don't you find that yeah, so Yeah, absolutely, true? and it's, yeah. it's, it's much more comforting. It is. It? it takes away all the sort of preciousness, isn't it? And I, you're down to brass tacks there. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah. One wouldn't even go into rehearsal with Trevor Nunn and say, Sir Trevor. No. Tell him you'd be thrown out of the room. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Anyway, um, he he was alive, and he had had the voice operation by that time, so the voice was quite ragged, but he was of immense instruction in the putting together. It was kind of a review with a light book going with it. Richard Rogers, how much inf- input would he have had to the actual instruments of the orchestra? He usually left that to his orchestrator and his MD, who in this case... The MD was Buster Davis, who was a marvelous. Did you know of him? No, 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 but yeah. I, I, I mean, I've seen his name. Yeah, he was sensational. He was a whole orchestra at the piano. And he, between him and the orchestrators, Luther Henderson being the principal, uh, they determined what it was. It was a 15 piece band in a theater called the Helen Hayes, which is gone. It's now the Marquis. They tore it down. And, but uh, it was very nice. The last show on Broadway, not to use mics. Wow. Totally acoustic. A large house. How lovely. It was. Which brings me to a point about amplification. Mm. Um, how have mics... Yes, how have mics changed? changed. Haven't they it's just... Called. They yeah. have... Testing one, two, testing. They have... <laughs> <laughs> Are we so quick? <laughs> We wouldn't be heard right now, would we, no. without them? The world would not be anywhere near the same. There would not be the availability of all the Television. millions of recordings, artists, mm. some of whom have gone and left only that. Let's consider Rachmaninoff. He did record. Absolutely. Not just his piano rolls, but he recorded, as did Gershwin even, a couple of things. And uh, we wouldn't have any of that. No, we wouldn't. But I'm thinking about the, the, the current trend of, well, of so cranking everything up so loud that you feel what? you're listening to a CD and you might as well go home and sit in the comfort of your own. There's an room. adage, mics beget mics. And once you start with one, you're caught. You can't have one person off mic and one sort of on and one on. Like we have. Yeah. <laughs> Like you, right? Jonathan and I share. Yeah, lean over friend. there. But I'm I'm so ancient that I remember Barbara Streisand, and it was only a few performances because she was pregnant, doing Funny Girl at the Prince of Wales Theatre in London. And I remember thinking, it's a it's quite a small voice, and you could hear her when she was singing, but not actually when she was talking. 
And mm. I was told she had microphones everywhere, you know, in a, if there was a, a, a vase on the table or a, <laughs> a vase of flowers, you know, they'd stuck a microphone in there, which, of course, was in the days before personal mics. Right, the orchestra right. wouldn't have been amplified at all, I would Not thought. at all, no. Following that trend of, mm. of mics begetting mics, then somebody said one day, well, now I'm hearing the voices so clear and the orchestra sounds like an orchestra of mice. You know, where where's the orchestra gone? Well, okay, so then they started area mics in the orchestra. And then pretty soon somebody said, well, I get the trumpet, but I don't get the oboe or the flute or the violin. So ultimately we had to have a mic for each instrument, in some cases more than one mic. I guess they've created a, a whole empire of dependency, sonically, mm. haven't they, in, in, the, in our field. And do you not think it's also possible that so many people have grown up with rock concerts and things that they almost expect the sound to be loud? loud? They do. And in fact, there's a saying, if it's too loud, you're too old. Oh, I think I'll just kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Or if it's too loud, yeah. you're not deaf enough. <laughs> So West Side Story wouldn't have been miked, do you think? No, it wasn't. It was not. The first miking was in Hello, Dolly, uh, which is pretty close to that time. But um, And would that have been personal mics you're talking no, about? No, they, they were so-called shotgun mics, or oh. what you were speaking of in the bus, hidden yeah. here, in the foots also. Actually, do you know, I remember doing something called Rock Carmen, and at the um, roundhouse here, uh-huh. you're absolutely right. And they were called, what, were they shotgun something like that? Rifle yeah. mics. Well, that we would had. be the same. And they the were same terrible thing. because they'd have them all strung up next to each other along the front. Oh, no, above and the front above of the stage them. as well. Yeah, but yeah. they had them above, and you could only hear them when they moved underneath the mics. So you know, you suddenly go, ah, <laughs> exactly, rah, exactly. But now they're miking shoes up if they tap on, so you can hear the I know the, the tap rhythms and things all over the theatre. Well, there you sound. are. It's, they did that in Billy well, Elliot. They have mic friends on his feet when he does sure, the big darts. That, that yeah. mad dance, right? And of course, sound supervisors and, and, and directors in sound are now, you know, up for awards and things. They are they, you know? for t- for Tonys in New York yeah. this season. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. But does that affect the way you the way you orchestrate? It must needs, but I still am old enough to be in the line of thought that fundamentally the orchestration must sound acoustically. If if we had our orchestra for Gone with the Wind in this room, we'd barely fit them in, but we would have an orchestration the way it, I think it should sound. Which would balance itself acoustically. It would. And the and incidentally, then the players rely on their music automatically on their musicianship to balance second trumpet should be a little less than first or the clarinet should be under the voice Mm -hmm. one must always remember we're almost always accompanying aren't we and uh yes acoustically i think is still the secret for successful orchestration Mm -hmm. but uh, we have to remember also that studio recording created a whole new concept of orchestration in that you could play close mic, say a clarinet, you know, in a very subtone and still have it loud as you wanted it. Well, Bernard Herrmann was the first person to start doing this because he would write, it may have been in the 60s when they started to use mics for film soundtracks, he would have an alto flute playing above 35 violins and you wouldn't be able to hear that in a real orchestra, but because of miking and close miking mm. and distance miking, I presume it's called. Yeah. You can then have the alto flute playing a solo. But then, of course, you have to be skillful, don't you, then? You have to know what you're doing to do that. Otherwise, mm. it's a cheat. I think before Bernard Herrmann, there was uh, Eddie Sauter and Finnegan. They experimented with mics and uh, woodwind balances. You're very against the use of synthesizers for the sake of real instruments in an orchestra, aren't you? I am. First of all, I think it's it's... It's a tragedy that musicians are losing out to these. I mean, musicians are... Well, they are, put you out of work machines, aren't they? They are. It's the Industrial Revolution all over again. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry, yeah, yeah, it is. There's quite a lot of difference in somebody that works on an assembly line for Ford and somebody who's devoted their life to playing the French horn or violin. I mean, this is a high calling, and um, they're losing out. It's a very sad situation. I, for one, will not be a part of, of that process. Now, mind you, synthesizers can be very useful in the orchestra. It's just that role that you described of 
So but if planting. they're copying, yeah, exactly, if they're yeah. copying what the orchestra, and it, it can't be the same because no. there's no personality in there's, there. And there's no breathing in it, no. and there's no bow moving at a different speed, at, Absolutely. at a different pressure. Which creates that sort of wonderful richness right. and depth. Right, right. and a change of vibrato. I mean, the vibrato is laughable on synthesized instruments because... It's so immediate. Okay. Yeah, or even if it starts up slowly and builds, it's still always the same yeah, thing. Absolutely. And it's the same. Yeah. An oboist, say, playing a passage may start with no vibrato, and he may decide the whole passage wants no vibrato, and it, but he'll make the expression through the change of color and the growth of dynamic and the sound and the way his breath is first coming out and then gradually losing that lung full of breath. I mean, it's it's so subtle and so nuanced. I was going to say, that's the subtleties of individual playing. Isn't it it is. The problem is with MIDI now, if you play with it enough, you can get subtle differences between the notes and the expression and things. But if you press stop and you play the piece again, it'll sound exactly the same. There's no way to have a random generator of yeah. expression which is what a human can do much easily than, mm. than a computer yes, and that, well that's... it's not random with the human that's the point no. expression is part of their being as yeah. a musician exactly they're expressing themselves that's why no two players will sound the same quite which is what makes music such an extraordinary I have yet to hear what you're describing it is possible I know this is possible but then what is the point because it would take it takes so, so long. long to do it mm-hmm. You'd have to program mm-hmm. it so slowly. You know, you might sort of hire someone in to come and play the actual instrument to be quicker. It's almost like that robotic voice. <laughs> right. Welcome to PT Amplifil. Hideous, isn't it? Isn't it, guys? Let's go on to... Uh, we've had a couple of listener questions. Let's go on to the first one. This is from my friend Irvin from Australia. Hello, Irvin. Where Wicked is soon to open, isn't it? Yes, it is. And he asks... As someone who writes songs but has little to no idea of how to orchestrate, he means him, not you, um, he'd be interested to know if Mr. Brown's approach is very clinical, i.e. I want to convey feeling as I will use instruments B and C in this manner, or if it's more based upon his own personal feelings, more of an artsy-fartsy kind of approach. It is feelings, of course. We pride ourselves in being interpretive artists, all of us, as players or as orchestrators. And I think feeling is the first thing that governs. I think technique is perhaps, of course it's necessary, but it it recedes into the background in your brain and and the, what is it, the left side comes... The left side The creative side, is it? The creative side is the the right side. Oh, the right side. I think it's the right side, (laughs) but it's always the opposite. Well, I'm dyslexic, (laughs) so no, I'm... In any case... uh, (laughs) Feeling is what takes over. I think as one listens through the years, sort of stores up sounds that one likes a lot in the in the head. But isn't it also true that, um, I mean, I think there's another question, I might be preempting that one, about technique. Yeah, it's the technique of orchestrating. There's a question from uh, Starry Harlequin who asks, is there a lot of training related specifically to orchestration or, or is it more of an innate ability? Well, innate happens to apply to just about anything people undertake. You can be an innate surgeon when you're seven years old I suppose but of course that that's helpful when that's there but I mean we've actually talked about this before Bill haven't we and really you do learn do you not by listening indeed it's the ears always isn't it but you do have to train training you have to know I know what the range of the instrument is you do it's easily learned it's like learning a typewriter keyboard I suppose eventually you but it's it's then you just make use of of these things the excitement of what a sound when you have heard it yourself does to you is what catapults you into orchestrating and recreating those sounds on the page i mean i can still remember the first time i heard uh, a cinema organ when i was a little kid you know and the thrilling feeling that this thing provided no speakers by the way (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or or a passing street parade, standing with my mother and father on the curb, feeling that visceral response of the bass drum coming up right up from the, the floor, up through. And that immediacy, it's almost like a, an earthquake as they go past, isn't, isn't it? it? It's that sort of immediate, I yeah. think. Yeah. I can remember having orchestration books. I think there was one by Hinder Metal. No, yes, there is. It, there is, isn't there? Yeah. I've got several huge... And they all say, do this, don't do this, and don't do that. But after you've done that, 
Do you, you know, listen to that? It's 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 like learning um, if you learning Bach chorale, so you don't do parallel fifths, parallel fifths and mm-hmm. fourths and things. Mm-hmm. Once you've done that, then you can break the rules, can't you? You can. It's important uh, to know the rules, I think, to begin it, with. It is, and and then one experiments and creates their own sound. I I would imagine Ravel broke a lot of rules, yeah. didn't he? Yeah, <laughs> Debussy. But he would have started, wouldn't he, knowing. <laughs> Yeah, I would still be able to teach somebody the rudiments yeah. and the fundamental. I have a question: stuff. If either of you have heard of something wonderful which I learnt about called the harmonic series? Yes. What about it? Do you what mean you... Um, the, the the tone row, or what? What do you mean? The overtones. Yeah. Oh, the overtones. It was something which it started off as an octave, then a fifth, then a fourth. Mm-hmm. It, it's and mm-hmm. if you look at that, that really is the history of music. The early music was very octave based. Then the medieval music Resume. came in. That's very fifth. Then or the Garnum. yeah. Mm-hmm. Then, mm-hmm. then the fourth was introduced. Then the yeah. third was introduced. Then, got, then, then the minor seventh was introduced, and it got to jazz. Then the dissonance was starting to introduce. Was it, this not going through all the harmonics? Is this what yeah. you're, you're saying? Didn't Archimedes or someone have something to do Probably. with this? I think he discovered a lot of that. Oh, we're getting uh, Pythagoras. Uh, well, maybe it's probably yeah, Pythagoras. Yeah. Archimedes was Eureka, wasn't Eureka. it? Eureka. But see, there you're into a technical discussion, mm-hmm. and it's good to know those things. In fact, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Like, I was so... It probably wouldn't get you on the subway in New York. When you're faced with orchestrating a, a score for a musical and the chart is due the next day, you're right. not thinking about the harmonic what did series. Said, when someone said... Um, he said, do you want it good or do you want it Thursday? <laughs> right. And then the answer to that from the producer is both. Yeah. Which Probably like, yesterday. <laughs> or you won't be paid. Jonathan, what, what is it about Bill's sound which makes us fans? I would say the first thing I would say that Bill has a remarkable lightness of touch. I don't mean and it's comedy. facile. No, I just think it's a lightness of touch. So you're not being bombarded with stuff. It's always very skillful, very tasteful. Never swamping the singers. And so many influences are in there, yet it's all Bill. Which... Again, your big mentor was uh, Russell Bennett, wasn't he? was indeed. His first show of note was Jerome Kern's Showboat in 1927. That's quite famous, isn't it? Showboat? Yeah. Never heard of it. Oh, shut up, Nick. Go on. <laughs> when, when did you orchestrate? Which well, version did you orchestrate? I was assistant conductor at Lincoln Center for the 1966 revival with uh, Barbara Cook and uh, mm. William Moorfield, Margaret Hamilton. Then... Uh, Many years later, I orchestrated, or let's say did the additional orchestrations for uh, the version that Garth Drabinsky produced in Toronto, Harold Prince directed, in 1995 or six, mm. And it went to uh, New York then and then toured. Because it we, came here then, yeah, too. Yeah, David yes, it was, Charles Abel conducted. It was at the Palladium. No, it was at the Prince Edward. Just Was it? Just after Crazy for You, which was a show that opened the Prince Edward. Which was yours. That's right. As well, yeah. yeah. So you've had three shows on now at the Prince Edward Theatre. I guess so, yeah. Yes. Crazy for You, yeah. Showboat. Oh, and Mary, Mary Poppins, Poppins, Mary Poppins, right. Which I have to say, I absolutely loved. I was lucky enough to go to the first night of that because um, Rosie Asher, who I used to play the piano for, was playing um, Nurse, whatever her name Miss was. Andrew. Miss Andrew. Miss Andrew. And, and Jared Carey, who, who's mm, been doing a podcast here, who was Roberts and I. And I remember sitting, I was in about the fourth row and just thinking, these orchestrations are out of this world. It was the thing that really, really, really made John them peaceful. Jonathan heard acoustically. Virtually acoustically. Mm, because mm. I was so far forward. Yes, I was, indeed. You know, yeah. the speakers were projecting beyond me. That's a redoubt for, uh, for orchestrators, too, in that when there is a good sound man in charge doing a good job in a acoustically friendly theater there is going to still be a residual of acoustical and it's we rely on that to help our our sound also imagine what it does for the musicians to be able to to play acoustically and hear acoustically and not worry too much about yeah. those mics in front of them yeah and um you are a, a witness to that in Absolutely. what you described and, and what was great of course the orchestra were in the pit as yeah. opposed to being locked away well, and what was even was better hate. was that there was a real piano in two, two real, real pianos. pianos count them two well we're going to have one in we had I used it again in curtains in New York and uh, I'm using it in uh, the present Gone with the Wind via Hamburg Steinway upright don't think we didn't have to fight to get that 
I bet you did. Yep, they wanted to have it sampled, you know. Really? Yep. But yet one of the pianos in Mary Poppins, is, is this one you're talking about, has also elect, elect well, electronic... Well, yes, actually both of them do. That's the interesting thing that ah. you were leading to. It's a, Sorry, yeah. it's a, it's a MIDI piano. So it doesn't have strings at all. It, well, it does. It does, it does have, have strings. Yeah. So you can use it yeah, as a real piano. Yeah, be careful that you don't confuse this for your audience because right. it, it, at all times you must remember this is an acoustic piano. But it's also a MIDI piano. It has the capability yeah. to MIDI. Yeah. I wouldn't call it a MIDI piano no. because the, the process is that there's a laser beam that is red for each key. And it has nothing to do, it, it, it has no influence over the keys and the touch and the action of the piano. It simply reads the velocity of that particular key uh, being depressed at that moment and sends that information, if wanted, to a, a computer that you can then assign any kind of midiing that you want. But it's optional. And you don't lose your piano. Right. So you can actually combine the two. And that's where uh, we came. If you've got two pianos, you mean two, two of them, you can... No, you could get one oh, piano. Well, you could anyway. You could, you yeah. could play the piano and have this going exactly. on at the same time. And oh. that, that was what uh, George and Stiles George came up about. with. Right, right. Producers don't like it because Cost it's a money. piano. Yeah. And you have to tune it. And you, you have to be careful. I mean, you have to... You know, it gets a lot of action and you've got to have a tech to come in and yeah. fix a broken this or that. Um, let's talk about Mary Poppins. It's very piano heavy, which is fine. Why was the decision to do that? We were limited in the number of players to 16, and in no way did we want to have an, an orchestra of, an almost orchestra, as I call it, you know, one of this and one of that, and one of this and one of that. So in the process of thinking this out with George Stiles, we came up with the idea of having a, a rather credible brass section of six players, two trumpets, two horns, two trombones with doubles, the woodwinds being three, two percussion, a guitar, bass, and a cello being the only string instrument and not treated like a string section, but treated as a cello, as a solo voice in the orchestra. Now, there is still something, a heart of, of the sound is missing when you don't have strings. I mean, the, the romantic heart is missing. The cello, of course, goes a long way toward that. But we thought the closest romantic substitute to that void that's left when there are no string sections is the piano. The Chopin, the The, Romanov. The king of... Mm, The expressive range of the piano is unparalleled, of course. Absolutely. How can someone, if you're relying so much on the pianos to fill that void, how could someone settle for a midi piano? First of all, the player won't settle for it. We had one of the finest players in London, Andy Massey, for Poppins, and he presently is doing Gone with the Wind, I'm happy to say. <laughs> Great. He said he would not have done the job if it had been a mini. It was horrible. You played a mine. I and he said he had, the, he had the problem in Porgy and Bess. He was called upon to play a midi. There's a whole four-minute section at oh, the beginning. Ding, 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 right. ding, which needs to be jangly and proper and, piano. Yeah. And he said, for, but it was also a question of the action. A pianist wants a proper pianist, such as you and not such as me, wants a... A force. A, yeah, wants it to fight back a little bit. I mean, you've got to... Yes. When you know that there's something going on yeah. when you hit those. But also, you know, the arm weight and everything you're going to it, you actually, then it becomes part of you. It's an extension of you, the it's piano. It's a key becomes, isn't it? Absolutely. And you can produce the most glorious sounds on a piano. You can't do it on the, the, the MIDI yeah. piano. It's no. absolute torture. And the yeah. other thing is it's not easy to be that accurate on those things because you can't feel your way around... The notes. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. There's no sort of feeling of mm, mm, when the uh, yeah, key goes yeah. down. It's it's horrible. Right. It's absolutely horrible. And, and you can horrible. use a feather touch on, on the piano, on the real piano, and and just and every harmonic and everything. It's mm. it's so different, isn't mm. it? Mm. And this question is from Lights, Places, Action. As someone who loves the Secret Garden and Wicked, uh, how do you go from orchestrating an operatic sort of show to a popular show? Um, well. Depends on the style of the. It it piece. does. Every piece calls upon a calls for a different style of writing of orchestrating. It indeed is led by the composer. Mm-hmm. The composer tells you what this should be, and 
is ours to dispose of his wishes, his his or hers wishes. I remember when Stephen Schwartz called me on Wicked, he said, I want you because of your symphonic sound. I needed all kinds of coaching from him to get the pop sound that he wants because he comes from that milieu, but he wanted that synthesis of the two. And that bad word, I shouldn't use synthesis that. Synthesis of synthesizers and... Yeah, that's like... So anyway, I say you were having to learn a bit on of that side of oh, stuff yes. as well. But now, yes. isn't it great? Though? It is. <laughs> we came up with a with a guitar sound that is called the Ebo. Yeah. I didn't come up with it. I mean, Stephen's guitarist did, and we spent a, quite a lot of time exploring it. That has, a, a, I think, brought a new sound. But now it's one of your trademarks, isn't it? For May. Um, two shows. I guess it's not yet a trademark, right. and it won't be in Gone with the Wind. <laughs> I looked it up on the internet, or we looked it up. Oh, on did the you? Yes, because we couldn't quite see how you played yeah. it. It seems as if there's something in the... Ebo stands for electric bow. Yeah. And what it does is it, it works uh, over the guitar. It hovers. There's an, an element that hovers over the guitar string. And as you finger the notes, yes. it slowly picks up the the vibration. But you are actually holding this thing, aren't yes. you? In the, yes, yes. In, in the... Um, Yes, the player the has to hold it. He fingers with the usual left hand. And yeah, he and then the right one. The... That is his bow. Got you. Yeah. It's an interesting sound. It, a little bit like the theremin. But depending on, of course, on what you want to mix it to be. Mm. I think you sampled a theremin in Mary Poppins because there's a bit where... No. Ne- it's is it an e real... bow. Oh, okay. It sounds a lot like a theremin because there's yeah, a bit it where, does indeed. where Nelius appears, where he comes yes, to life for the first right. time, and it sounds a lot like a theremin. It's, but it's, 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 it, it can do amazing yeah. tricks, the e bow. Jolly Holiday in slow, no- in slow motion. A, right. Mm-hmm. And of course, working with um, someone like George Stiles, I would think, would be great because he's a musician himself. I mean, he, he, he plays the piano and he reads. Yeah, and It is. It's. It's so gratifying yeah. to work with, with those people. And Stephen Flaherty, who is a conservatory trained musician, is. let's talk about Ragtime because that is an epic piece. I, I, I do. Stephen Schwartz and I agree it's one of the best musicals of the past fifty years because it's it's just so well put together. It's so. What was the creative process of that like? Because there must have been so many changes between its various productions. Well, there were. Um, Stephen and Lynn came to me in, uh, oh, must have been a year before it went into production and um, told me, you know, played numbers, sang. I, I hadn't known them before that and sang numbers. And then it went into production and first in a workshop, which is the way of things nowadays, and a good way to explore a musical. It went into a workshop in Toronto and then into production and between the workshop and beginning of production there were enormous changes many rewrites then it went into production and the author had an agreement Edgar Doctorow who was the author of the novel Ragtime that he be present and have certain veto powers he didn't abuse that he was very helpful and he he brought the whole spirit of the thing together and very quietly guided the the essence of the piece and uh the director, of course, who was Frank Galati, we shaped it up many times in Toronto through rehearsal, through production, through previews. Then before it moved on, it went to, because the theater wasn't ready in New York, it went to Los Angeles first, all kinds of changes for, for that. Then whilst in Los Angeles, we did a um, symphonic suite, which was premiered at the Hollywood Bowl. And then going into New York, again, a lot of rewrites and then during previews more rewrites finally it was frozen <laughs> i was played the cd by rosemary ash because she was going to go up and audition she said listen to this you know it was huh. absolutely wonderful yeah. and then of course it didn't happen did it the open number yeah. just grows so gracefully on your behalf and probably steven's behalf as well just the solo piano and then it the was the only it's in. a nine minute number nine minute plus number and that's the only way you can do a number like that is to find an arch in it and and uh you let the audience wait for the instruments you you? you do have to and indeed the piano being stephen's instrument and the ragtime instrument and the ragtime instrument Mm. was the right thing to open with Mm. but you're right about the 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 arch and the arc and all that because if you don't you've got everything throw it at them all at once and and pretty soon you lose the audience don't Mm. you becomes relentless doesn't it yeah Mm. and this was the way that 
Galati could take the various groups, the immigrants, uh, the Yankees, mm. you know, the indigenous people of New Rochelle and New York, and um, introduce them one by one and then bring them together into a coalescing. Harry Houdini has the uh, glockenspiel circus-like effect and... Oh, yeah. The, um, the, the, the immigrants have the klezmer vibe. The kles- yeah, and the clarinet. Well, you're quite right about that, but I'm at rehearsals in this process, as you well know, uh, and it's discussed with the director, with mm-hmm. the, and you hear the actors singing, and then, of course, the composer and the lyricist have their say with you. And so somehow you, together you come up with these mm-hmm. things. Don't, it's not a one-person thing. Which people think it is because you see labels and you think... Well, indeed. But I couldn't stress too much what the collaborative process is in music theatre. Um, Lights, Places, Action has a second part to his question. What was the creative process behind the Secret Garden CD cast recording? It's so well put together that you can understand the story. Tom Shepard, the producer. He was with RCA Victor at one time and later became freelance. He's still working in New York, but I... There are so few shows now. He he was the brains behind that. Naturally, I, again, in collaboration with the, the authors, Lucy Simon and Marcia Norman, and the director, and again, collaboration. I mean, first of all, there's there's a novel there, and then there's Marcia Norman, who's done a book and lyrics, and there's Lucy mm-hmm. Simon, who has put these exquisite tunes to it. And um, one of the tasks in music theater is to tell a story, isn't it? Well, some of it's not narrative, but uh, most of it is, I think. And in, in that show and in Miss Saigon, you get the chance to do some Eastern music with Tableau and Gamelan in Miss Saigon. How do you go about arranging these instruments? Because they're not these traditional orchestral lineups, are they? No, they aren't. I, I totally cribbed on the Indian music. I, I know nothing about it other than a, a sitar and uh, the tablas. And tablas but, and I used them. Uh, but the, I think the guitarist played a... No, he didn't. There are some guitarists that can play a, a kind of a fake sitar. Mm. I didn't. I used sampled there. Yeah. I used tablas in the orchestra. Whereas in Saigon, no, I didn't. Um, uh, I, I really did a lot of research on those instruments, the gamelons and the uh, percussion instruments and the flutes, the Asian flutes. Mm. And fortunately, here in London, had the resources to uh, to get the players and mm-hmm. the instruments. Some of them we sampled only in that there's simply no room in the pit for the gamelons, for example, um, you know, the gongs. Although uh, there's room for a, a lot, I had three players for the percussion section in the original Saigon. Okay. They had a third of the pit at the Drury Lane. Wow. Yeah. Did they have to take their shoes off? Yeah. I used to play the gamelan. Did you? At school. We were young, young enough to done. But I was doing a, um, I did a children's a schools program called Music Time, and I can remember because there were so many Asian children by then, you know, and mm. that, they came in and we did a whole thing on tablas and gum. I'd never have known about it if I hadn't, you know, been doing the show. So it was great, a great learning yeah. curve for me. And in the Secret Garden, uh, the original, I had a dulcimer, a hammered dulcimer, which is an American instrument of Appalachian origins Mm. probably colonial and then Appalachian and it's a very dulcet beautiful symbol on it has a character that can't be replicated except by a synthesis (laughs) by a sampling which we had to do because you can't find dulcimer players but we had a marvelous one in the pit in New York after that it was forget it you know you've got to take it on the road you're not bringing a dulcimer so we we sampled it there's a case of sampling was. being not only useful but years mandatory ago, years ago people i mean there were more people i think who did play the dulcimer because you're always hearing about them taking on on board ships and playing them there oh, and all that. oh really so uh-huh. probably in the uh-huh. 20s and 30s maybe i would imagine b- before recordings had yeah had kind of spoiled the listener yeah right? yeah which is of eastwick Ooh. what was it like working on that show with the three women flying off into the jury lane Belfry. Well, that was a, a, a task. We had a lot of changes in that one, too. But, uh, I mean, it seems to be standard. With your uh, bass harmonica that you use. Uh, sampled. Well, unfortunately, yeah. That that was just 
a momentary thing in the orchestra, but the biggest challenge was keeping up with the physical production that had to go through so many changes. I never saw it, Jonathan, but you did. I did, yes, and in fact, funny enough, I played um, a couple of the songs that Rosie Ash's Felicia Yes. was auditioning for and I actually trained her up well I trained her up I mean I coached for, her through for, for, for the audition for which the, she, of course she got didn't she she did indeed and happily she did yeah yeah, yeah. she was terrific in that part she sung her evil song with candles coming out of her mouth and stuff yeah she was a bit upset because um, she had a song about it went on about the egrets or something which were cut oh which yes was cut it and she was got, there's quite upset about that but she got over it I know and it was Do a lovely you, song there, there you are, though. You can't you get know. upset when songs are cut, because I'm sure you've sat and had sleepless nights writing of songs that get cut eventually. I'm sure well, you just can't let it get to you. No, but if, you're, if you're the one singing it, you would be, wouldn't you're you? Going, and if it's your only song. Yeah. True. And uh, Which it wasn't, actually. She did yeah, have two. But. Yeah. She has her dirty laundry bits. And yeah, that. she has all that. Yeah, it's hard for her. Now. I mean, it's stressful for everybody, Yeah, putting a musical yeah. together. You're... You're really on your toes all the time. and But it's yeah. still great fun, though. Up to a point where there isn't, there's a bizarre thing where, uh, you know, if they cut something or change the order of something, you think, oh, my God, I'm never going to get this into my head, and it's all thrown. Then about three performances later, you've forgotten it, and that, that, that is yeah, what it is. Yeah, and pity the actors during previews who, during the day, are rehearsing the changes, which, believe me, are rampant. That evening, they have to go do the old version until it's ready to be teched and put on stage. Yeah. Then they get to do the new version. Yeah. And then, as you say, for three nights, it, it can be quite horrifying. Absolutely awful, because your, your instinct is to do the way you've learned it. It's mm. gone into the memory banks, is not it, mm. and all that. Difficult. It's a war, isn't it, putting on a musical? Yeah. It's a, I mean, I haven't really done that much of it. I'm a musical director to few, but I tend to, the orchestrations I tend to do are for stuff that I do for concerts and things, so it's mm. not actually collaborative in the way that you mm. have to be. Mm. I think you've got much more patience. Do you work with your singer, don't you? Yes. So yes. that's sort of clever. Yes, and she, and she will sometimes suggest things. She's great, but I'm lucky she's a very musical, this is Sophie Louise Dan, she's a very mm. musical, mm. musical singer. singer. Now, this musical Wicked, it's quite successful around the world. So it seems. Why? I think we've asked ourselves that question, mm. we being the people involved with the mm. show, over and over. Um, you and I have asked it together. And we, we, we have. I'm not sure I have the answer, but one of the reasons may be that it, it has a magical... Uh, it touches a magical nerve somehow, in a nerve that responds to magic in, in the audience. And it does not just seem to be, as is often reported by the naysayers, uh, a show for teenage girls. Indeed, they are there, but I have never seen such a, a cross-section of audiences. Because we went to see it in London quite recently, and we you did. were surprised at the audience and how warm right. they were to the reception and things. They and, were. Uh, Do you have a, a slant on that? Well, I think it's the misunderstood person mm. finally being accepted into her milieu. And then you also have her fighting against the machine in a way which is what the wizard, the wizard represents right. with all his cogs and mm -hmm. stuff like that it's prejudice and, isn't it a lot of it is. then further to that then what would you say the role of the music is in wicked you're talking mainly about concepts and mm. themes and and the book aspect i think well, it's too in heart to because Stephen doesn't use pastiche apart from the wizard in the score so I think the music moves the audience to this completely different world. Would you agree? It's all that there's weird chord changes in the music and there's synthesizers. There are. <laughs> but you know, I, I well, that A G minor F minor B progression in the opening. Da 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 da. Oh, it's just parallel. I Claude Michel does that in Saigon too. Oh, well. Yeah. But I I have a feeling I don't know because um, I was in Scotland and there was a bunch of musicians, very young people who were coming to play some stuff. They sat down and suddenly they opened this music and it was wicked way before it came over here. Hmm. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Um, you know, what is that? Because I, I didn't really know wicked at that time because I know it really well now because I've had to play for so many people's auditions again because hmm. everybody went up for that, didn't they? And um, he just said, they, they, they both said, we just love the music. So there's something... That's there got she. the young people by the throat, and they yes. 
absolutely have gone mental. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it well, is, it's bizarre. It's become almost cultish it has. in that way. That what leads one to wonder if there's a little danger in that, if it won't, in a, in a couple of years, seem like an old hat, like something quite passe. Well, I mean, how can one really project? Well, I mean, I suppose, things, but... you know, if you're looking at Stephen Schwartz, I mean, things like Godspell went on, you know, they were so popular at the time, weren't they? They were. Um, but now it's and then Pippin. But, and then Pippin. But Godspell was the, the big one. Wasn't and wasn't the baker's wife him as well? Yes. It was. It didn't uh, do well in the states. It didn't but it, do well here either. It didn't. But there's some nice music in it. Oh yeah, lovely music. He's a great, great composer and a yeah. great lyricist as yeah. well. And it's interesting. We had um, Martin Ball on, who played Dots Lillimond in London. He was saying the critics didn't respond greatly to Wicked in London, and they all said each critic would say, you know, there was only one song which I found catchy, and they would say it was popular. Then another critic would say, there's only one catchy song yeah. in the show, and that's The Wizard and I. There's only one catchy song yeah. in the show, and that's Define, Defying Gravity. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, yeah. it's, the critics are out to get this show, aren't they? Because oh, it's yeah. so popular. And it's absolutely critic-proof. Yes, yeah, it's made absolutely it no difference whatsoever. <laughs> Thank you for the audience. Right? Yes. And here's a big, absolutely. big round of applause for the audience. But, well, you know, but I was thinking about something else, because the music isn't that different from say Godspell or is it really no, in its no. feel it's not uh, and, and, and in fact the way it's written and you know you would have thought oh well if that's considered 70s very you know 1970s mm -hmm. the fact that it's back with a vengeance now must say something that, yeah it. it does it does if you, if you I wonder if, if it if the cultists that you speak of aren't just one part of that audience well, the cultists, you know I mean? they are the ones we often notice because yeah. they're a bit and there might be all these people who but, the normal yeah, people but exactly the people that that keep come keep this show going are the the ordinary punters yeah. but when i went to see it with you nick it felt as if i was going in to see something that everybody knew and i didn't really know it's almost like seeing rocky horror show for the first i was just time. going to say were. And they uh -huh. knew everything. And uh -huh. they were going absolutely ballistic at certain things, and you knew they'd a seen it before. A That's riff. a bit unfair to the rest of the audience, oh, isn't it? Yeah. The, 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 well, it was more of the audience than I thought it was going to be. Mm. I mean, it seemed to be all mm. over the place. It probably a little bit unfair. There are lots mm. of people who will mm. sit, who will get um, tickets just to see the show with 13, 15 of their friends, mm. and they will make it very hard for the cast because they will distract them. That's true. They will wave at them and giggle at oh, them and dear. show their yeah. signs up in the air. That's... And they have no consideration for the other 2,000 people who have paid £60, $120 to see this show. That's a serious problem. Right. Um, and, and that's taking it like a rock show. Yeah. It in is. In that sense. It is. And it's so loud. Yeah. You know, that yeah. maybe yeah. they think, oh, it doesn't really matter. You know, if they actually... If it were quieter, maybe you know mm -hmm. they, they wouldn't be able to do that. They'd be embarrassed or something. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's loud. It's just a vast. It's a big sound. Yeah, it's a big space as well. But there is an enormous variety in those songs too. Oh yes. When you, as you pointed out, the critic, one critic liking one and one liking mm -hmm. until you go right down the line. But he he has managed to draw them together into this this one theme. I know it's very clever. I, some of it might have to do with believing in magic that that this is I'm sure Stephen, everything somehow points to i'm sure Stephen schwartz by now believes heavily in magic <laughs> you know it's so much of it is down to you make or break time whether the show works or not being an orchestrator mm -hmm. so much right. of it does no pressure no it's not that it's just the fact that but of course the audience isn't aware of that side of it. No. They see everything else, don't they? But they it do. does mean you can be anonymous and you can go and see the show and everybody's not going to go, oh, <laughs> you know, and all that. Yeah. Maybe you'd like that. But <laughs> the visual is the first organ of response, and isn't it? It is. Therefore, the producers, understandably, are going to pay more attention to the visual, yeah. which is everything but the music. Yeah. Um, and music somehow, even, despite what we seem to be giving this importance to it probably is the least important of all the elements to a to a producer to a it's, producer no yeah. yes i agree yeah i mean, otherwise they wouldn't 
be um, lacerating our orchestras like they are. Yeah. But no, I was thinking about, about, about not that side of it as much as the fact that, I mean, if, you know, um, the King and I or any of the um, Rogers and Hamsani's great stuff, before you get, you know, the sad scene where the King's dying at the end, you've got something wonderful being played, underscoring, leading into something. Yeah. And that's what gets the tear ducts. Doesn't doing it. it, and if you just had it, that's what Walt Disney understood so well, didn't he? Once yeah. you just put that image up there, it's flat and blah blah, blah and the music gives it this third dimension or this yeah. depth. This Our friend and co-presenter yeah. Lisa, her favourite moment in Wicked is when you have a popular played on a toy box. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Which much much later on, yeah. when yeah. Glinda is trying to be popular, and it's mm. sort of you could mm. look at it and say it's reverting mm. back to her mm. youth and things like that, mm. and, and that really. I think I, I should go back and see it again. I've only <laughs> seen it once. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll get your house seat. Oh bless. You, you I, went, I mean, you were ill the last. I time. was ill as well. Oh, no. Of salmonella, which isn't great when seeing oh. a green show. Oh, my God. No, I walked into the. I walked and I went. Oh, isn't it green? Oh, it was no. So green. Oh. It was the colour of me. You could have lit the whole stage. I could have done with your with your limelight. <laughs> well, no, I was just going to say, but it's obviously set to stay, isn't it? Wicked. It it does seem so. Looking to April two thousand and nine in London. Is it? Yep. Really. So curtains. Mary Poppins. Wicked. Miss Saigon. Witches of Eastwick. Oliver. My Fair Lady. South Pacific. I, I could go on and on and on. Gone on, with the wind. Gone with the wind. Gone wind. With the wind. Which, we must, you, which a, we must let you get back to. Because well, I can see you've got your manuscript. First, paper we're going to have some supper. Yes, yes, we are. When does Gone with the Wind open? Its first preview is April 4th. 4th of April. Get it the Brit way. And the press night is 22nd of April. And I hope we can go and see it and give it a wave of you. I hope you will. Thank you very, and very we'll much. And we'll talk after Thank it's you. open. Yeah, brilliant. Wonderful. Absolutely. Absolute pleasure, Bill, and thank you very, very much for Indeed, all your I... contribution to the world of musical theatre. And uh, we look forward to much more of it in the future. So do I. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah. <laughs> this has been a production of Musical Talk, copyright 2008. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at feedback at musicaltalk.co.uk. Thanks for listening.